Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about modules and how they relate to namespaces in a variety of languages, including C20, which we focused on last time. But I'm going to start in Python because it's a simple place to start. My example in all the languages is going to have an application A, which uses library B, and B uses library C. And I'm going to treat these as if they were separate libraries as opposed to different parts of the same library. And in each of these cases, Application A is going to print the result of concatenating A with whatever B calculates. And B is going to calculate prepending B with whatever C calculates. And what C is going to calculate is the string C. So we're going to pretend this takes the place of much more sophisticated calculations, but we're going to get ABC out of it. So let's run our Python here, a.py and we get ABC as expected. So one of the things about Python is that every file implicitly defines a module and a namespace. And so I can import C for use in B, and I can import B for use in A, and each of them has their own namespace. But one of the things that Python does do, which personally I have a pet peeve against, is that it automatically bleeds anything from the global scope of a module into the exports of that module. So for example, because I imported C, I can also access it through B in my A. And this actually does apply in a lot of real life Python code. So for example, the standard module OS, if I look at it, it imports other modules as well and I could have access to those through OS. I shouldn't, but it's not easy to stop me. There is a standard for defining alls on things, meaning that these are the things that ought to be exported by default. Uh, however, nothing's going to stop me from importing things that aren't inside of that list of all. And notice also not as simple as a, just a list here because I have arbitrary code that runs that may or may not import other things and or add things to my all. So over here in B, I'm trying to say I only, I only want to export calc. And C, I also say I only want to export calc, which again, nicely are automatically namespaced against from each other. But even though I say I'm only exporting calc, C is going to be available in A anyway, as we already saw. And furthermore, pylint out of the box at least, doesn't care about the fact that I access something that technically I didn't declare to be exported. So even my linter doesn't really care about that. Uh, now that we've got a chance to see how Python works and get a feel for what each of these demos is going to look like, let's move on to C, which is really our lingua franca of computing in recent decades. So C is going to be a little bit trickier for concatenating strings, so the example gets more complicated. But I'm creating a buffer here, and then I am also defining my value A to go into my buffer. And then I'm also putting uh, B onto the end of A, and I can print that out. I've included B.H which has a prototype for B underscore calc, because in C, everything is part of the same global namespace no matter what file you're in. So you have to be explicit in naming your things and find some kind of naming convention that works for you to make sure you know that your functions are uh, specific to this library. And there's no standard convention anywhere. I personally like the idea of putting your uh, library name underscore in front of anything that you're doing inside of your library. And so here's the implementation. And B you include C.H, has a prototype for CCalc, and that implementation. So if we run this all together, it all works great. And one thing to note here again is that we have a common namespace uh, for all of our files. There's no such thing as the implicit namespace we had in Python. And so, for example, I can technically access ccalc even though I haven't included it because it's going to be a symbol defined in the final executable. So it says you have an implicit declaration of ccalc, uh, but it's still compiled and I get uh, my value out. Furthermore, I could attempt to, if I hadn't been careful with my namespacing, I could attempt to make new functions that conflict with things defined in external libraries. And in this case, a linker complains at me because that was already defined. If we move on to C++, not 20, 
uh, we find that things are very similar to what we had in C with the difference that now we have explicit namespaces instead of implicit ones in how we name things. But again, each file is by default part of the same global overall namespace as opposed to being like Python where each file by default defines its own namespace or module. So here we have application A includes b.hvp where I have a prototype and then b has, is implemented inside of b.cvp which includes c.hvp which has its own prototype and its own implementation. And we're going to treat these as if they were three separate libraries in terms of how we want to think about them today. Let's go over to C++ land and run this and we see ABC again. But again just like in C, we're really part of the same overall namespace. It just happens to be the case that I can be explicit about these namespaces. So here for example I define namespace C all over again and when we get to the linker it complains that says you already defined a C calc, you can't make a new C calc. However, unlike C, C++ tends to be a little more strict about things I haven't defined. So if I haven't included the header for C, then it tends to complain directly at me on something not being defined. Let's compare this with what we get in C++20. In C++20 uh, we're going to do imports rather than includes and so A is going to import B, B is going to import C, and I'm going to export these modules and explicitly export the functions that I want exported from inside of my namespaces which are still required in C++20 despite my modules. So let's go over to C++20 land and run there and make sure things go as expected. ABC, awesome. And worth noting here as well that because I have not exported C, I don't automatically have access to it. So for example we see here that we don't have access to it as expected. However, if I wanted to I could export my import and that would give me access to it. And by the way, uh, for those interested, I'm using Clang 9 for doing my C++20 modules. They don't have full support but they have sufficient support for this demo. If you look at my previous video you'll see examples of how this build process works. Meanwhile, let's move on to JavaScript slash ECMAScript, which in some ways feels a lot like C++20 because I have explicit imports and exports. And in other ways it feels like Python because every file implicitly defines its own module and namespace. And by default these namespaces don't actually necessarily even have names. Let's look at JavaScript. I'm going to use Dino to run this because that makes life easier than Node for these purposes. And I see that that it worked first of all. Second of all we see our same examples before that we import everything from B as B and for the, here we import everything from C as C. And in each of these cases just like in C++20 if I don't export it I can't see it externally. And that includes the fact that I can't see C from B. So this worked in Python where the namespace bleeding occurred but in JavaScript it's not going to happen. I would have to explicitly export my C in order to have it available inside of A through B. And personally I find this to be fantastic and this is one of the things I really like about how JavaScript works. Every file is a namespace and the only things you see are the things that are exported. And I find that very clean and great to work with. We're going to see something similar when we move over here to Zig. Zig is a compiled language that compiles to efficient native code. However, in some ways it feels a little bit like Python or JavaScript because every file is its own module automatically, meaning it's its own namespace, and the things that are visible are only those things that you export. So I have this compiler intrinsic function called at import, which runs at compile time, and I assign it to a local constant. And therefore I have access to whatever's inside of those uh, modules that I've imported. So I here have imported standard and I have access to things inside of it or I can import B and have access things to things inside of it, b.calc for example. If I come over here to b.zig it imports C and C just calculates an awesome string C. Again B concatenates them, A concatenates everything together and we're going to get out of here. ABC. And just like we saw in ECMAScript, we cannot access things that haven't been exported from the module in question. Over here if I wanted C to be visible outside of B, I would have to put a pub for public in front of it. 
And then, had I left it here, would have been available inside of my A. Now, the other thing interesting here is what kind of name mangling goes on? I never explicitly said what's my namespace for B or C, so I get curious about that. And if I run readelf to take a look at this, I'll see that they've name mangled B's calc to B.calc and C's calc to C.calc. And personally, that's pretty clean name mangling. If it stays that way and they can pull it off, I'll be happy with that. Let's move on to Ruby. I want to compare and contrast Ruby with our default C++ because in some ways it's very similar. Unlike JavaScript and unlike Zig and unlike Python, but more like C and C++, Ruby, every file just is acting in the same global namespace. So I can require B from A and B can require C and C just returns our calculation of C again. In each of these I define a module which is somewhat similar to how I would define a namespace in C++. A lot of differences, but for our purposes, they're fairly similar. And if I come over here and run it, I get ABC as expected. Now, unlike C and C++, where you have conflicts at a linker if you try to redefine things, in Ruby, you overwrite the previous definitions because that's the way it thinks about things dynamically. So I've just changed the definition of module C here. And furthermore, I can access C from anywhere in the require chain because it's sort of as if I had included my headers across the whole way in C++. So Ruby, despite being a dynamic language, has a lot more of the C or C++ feel for what files mean and how namespaces work. And before we finish for the day, I want to move on to Elixir and Rust because they have an interesting notion that by default, you're actually not needing to import your libraries. If they're made available to the execution system or the compiler, they're just gonna be there uh, available. So let's go to our Elixir land. Elixir sort of borrows this notion to some extent from Erlang. So let me run Elixir here and I'm gonna get ABCs before. Notice A doesn't import B, it just uses B. And B doesn't import C, it just uses C. And of course, C does its own thing. Because these modules are compiled such that they're gonna be on my path that Elixir looks at, they're just automatically going to be available. And by default, everything's gonna be namespaced according to the module that it's defined in. And this is actually fairly similar to how things work for crates in Rust. The difference is that instead of having a path, you have to explicitly tell the compiler what mappings exist. So when I compile B, I'm going to tell it that C is defined in this library. And when I compile A, I'm going to tell it that B is defined in this library. And I have to build them in order. Normally you will not use Rust C this way in Rust. You will rather create a cargo file and use cargo to manage your builds for you automatically. But in all these cases, I'm trying to look as low level into the compilers and execution engines as I can to see what's going on under the hood. So over here in A, just like in Elixir, we don't import anything. Had B and C been sub-modules of my crate, I'd do something different. But being a separate crate, meaning a separate library, I don't actually specify an import at all. It's just made available by how I'm using the compiler. I say B calc. Over here in B, I say C calc. And over here in C, I just do whatever I want to do. And if I come over to Rust, and run it, I get ABC. And unlike Elixir, however, if I try to access C without making it available explicitly to the compiler, then it says, I don't know what that is, and it complains at me. So there's a more explicit control for each particular compile step as opposed to being a general purpose path. And of course, uh, like I said, you would normally use cargo for Rust. You normally use something called mix for Elixir and so on and so forth. But I've been demoing things at the low level compiler and execution engine level. Anyway, we got a chance to see a variety of languages here that look at things in a variety of different ways. And I hope it's been interesting. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye, y'all.